All right, tonight we're going to talk about the higher invertebrates. Last time we uh, covered the primitive invertebrates, and as you know, we took a look at, at, at the beginning, we defined an animal as something that was eukaryotic, uh, multicellular. Uh, we saw that they also ingest their foods so they're heterotrophic. They move from place to place. Uh, we saw that they exhibit some type of symmetry, and most of them have some type of sexual reproduction in their life cycle. So we defined an animal that way, and then we said, okay, we're going to take a look at it from the zoological viewpoint <clears throat> and, and uh, go from the simplest to the most complex. So yesterday we took a look at the periphera as the most simple organism in this kingdom, the most simple animal. Uh, we then went to the cnidarian and studied those. We took a look at the flatworms and the nematodes. So here's where we are now with the higher invertebrates. Now as we start out, why should we study human, I mean, uh, higher invertebrates? Well, here's a question for you. What are these? Do you know? Banana slugs. Those are banana slugs, two of them. And uh, banana slugs are important in California history because they were considered to be the official state mollusk. They are not, but they were almost the official state mollusk. Um, in the 1980s, they were approved by a majority vote in the legislature in California, but that was struck down by the Duke. The Duke was George Duke Majin who vetoed this proposal. He viewed the measure as frivolous, even though it was. Uh, his quotation, the uh, abalone would be more appropriate if the state had to have an official mollusk. I agree. So there's the abalone right there. Um, have no fear. Uh, the banana slug is still the mascot of the University of California at Santa Cruz. Sammy the slug is his name. There he is right there. All right. That is why we should stay. The higher invertebrates. So let's start, let's begin. There are four different groups in the higher invertebrates. There's the phylum mollusca, the soft bodied animals. Then we'll take a look at the phylum anelida, which is the third of the three worm groups, the three, uh, of the three worm phyla. And we'll take a look at the phylum arthropoda, which is a huge group. Um, over a million different species of animals are known and classified. They have been studied. These include the insects. And the last group we'll take a look at, at tonight is the Echinodermata. So let's begin our journey tonight with not these four groups, but a clarification of what we started yesterday. Um, taking a look at the coelom and what it is. Now, some of these are repeat drawings, uh, diagrams from last time. Let's see if we can clarify what we mean. Uh, when we have the coelom, which is the fluid-filled sac where we stick our organs, we subdivide that into groups that have the coelom versus groups that don't. That's solid body versus internal body cavity. Some have a fake coelom, if you will, that is not completely lined with mesoderm. The rest of them have a true coelom. And even those true coelums are divided up into two different types, the protostomes and the deuterostomes. That's an organizing slide. Let's go and uh, again define the coelum as in animals, a body cavity between the body wall and the digestive system that forms during pre-adult development. Hmm. All right. It's this body cavity right there between the gut. It's yellow here. That the gut is the digestive system and the body wall. That's the body wall right there, right on the outside. So in this picture, the brown area is the coelom. That's a fluid-filled sac where we're going to stick the organs. Your lungs go there. Your heart goes there. Your pancreas goes there. <clears throat> These organs go in this fluid-filled sac called the coelom. Now, some animals are so simple, they don't need a coelom. Those are called acelomates. They have a solid body. The acelomates we saw yesterday are the periphera, which are the sponges, the cnidarians, which are the jellies, and the platyhelminthes. Like that one pictured here, 
This is a planarian, and a planarian is part of the group Platyhelminthes. Remember Platyhelminthes, God bless you, God bless you means flat worm. Platyhelminthes, flat worms. So it's a solid body. These guys don't have a coelom at all. They just have a solid body. They don't have any complex organs, nowhere to put it. They don't need a, any complex organs anyway, because they're just going to diffuse things through the skin, whether it's waste products or oxygen, whatever it needs, it diffuses through the skin. So you don't need a circulatory, excretory system. You don't need a respiratory system, because you're diffusing what you need through the skin. All right. And then there are the pseudocelomates. Pseudocelomates are the round worms. Saw those at the end of, of the last talk. And it's a pseudocelomate because it's a fake coelom. That is to say, it's not a true coelom, it's a fake coelom. If we take out these yellow substances here, which represent the internal organs, you'll see this is a space that's a fluid-filled cavity called the coelom. And then we stick those organs in the coelom. But this coelom only has mesoderm on the outside. There's no mesoderm surrounding the digestive uh, system right there. That's what makes this a pseudo coelomate versus a coelomate. Now, the picture isn't that clear, so I'm going to show you a better one. Here's the better one. This is not a angled section, but a, a pure cross section. And you can see now that this white section is the coelom. Here it is, and here it is. But this is the pseudo coelom. Hopefully, you can see that the outside of the white region, that's right here, that's mesoderm. On the inside of the white region, there's no mesoderm. Mesoderm is where the organs come from. So most of the organs now, all of the organs are gonna be coming off of the mesoderm that way. This is more complicated, more complex. What you have here is the same format where you have the coelom, and the mesoderm on the outside, but now you have mesoderm on the inside as well, which is on the outside of the digestive system. And so that makes for a more complicated, more complex uh, organism, because it's able to derive the organs from both types of mesoderm. On top of that, you have this thing in between called the mesentery. Mesentery is that uh, almost like saran wrap that holds everything together. You're going to see that very well on Thursday when you uh, take a look at the frog and dissect the parts. So on the left you have a pseudo coelomate and on the right you have a coelomate. That's the difference between the two. All right. Now we have a true coelom. But even in a true coelom, you can separate the true coelom into two different types. You have the protostomes and the deuterostomes. Now we've seen all of these terms before in one way or another. So proto means before, or let's say first in this case. Stome means like the stomata on the bottom of the leaf, which is a hole on the bottom of the leaf. Stome means mouth. So proto stome, the mouth comes first. Here the deuterostome, deutero means second, and so deutero, second mouth. The mouth comes second. We are deuterostomes. During development, our mouth forms not first, but second. We're talking about the two holes of the digestive system. Picture this. If you have a sperm and an egg getting together during fertilization, you have a fertilized egg and a zygote now, and the zygote divides into two cells, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, 128, 256, 512, keeps going. You get this. Now you have several thousand cells. And they're arranged in a hollow ball called a blastula. You saw the blastula when we were studying mitosis, and you took a look at onion root tips, but then you also looked at the whitefish blastula. Remember that? So the whitefish blastula is an example of a blastula stage. Now, the blastula stage is typically a hollow ball, but even after that, it keeps growing and growing, and there's nowhere to go, nowhere to grow. So what happens then is the blastula is like a tennis ball. You ever play catch with your dog with a tennis ball? 
And then for me, if, if the big dog, that tennis ball only lasts two, three minutes. Because my Labrador pop it, and what happens to the tennis ball? It goes in on itself. That's exactly what happens here. Now what happens is you get this hollow ball and it still keeps growing and it, it in essence pops and it goes in on itself. Well where it goes in on itself, for some coelomates, uh, the mouth forms from that. For others, the anus forms from that and the mouth comes later. Okay. Now this seems like an artificial distinction, but it is one that is commonly used. Also in this, uh, in this splitting of the true coelomates into the protostomes and the deuterostomes, we see that the actual formation of that fluid-filled sac is different. In one, it comes from a splitting, and one, the other, it comes from uh, the outpouching of the gut. We'll see it diagram of this in a moment. We'll also see that the more advanced animals are deuterostomes of the nine major phyla in the animal kingdom. We, being chordates, um, are deuterostomes and there's one other group that has deuterostomes in it and that's why we classify that one group just before we start studying our chordata. And surprisingly enough, let's see Chinodermata which are sea stars, sea urchins, sea cucumbers, and their relatives. Out of all the invertebrates, we classify them as the most highly advanced because they have some similarities to us on the cellular level. So let's take a look at some pictures of, of uh, what we're talking about right here. Um, here's a protostome versus deuterostome. This is uh, much more information than you need, but if you take a look at the picture, you'll see that here is that hollow ball, the blue part, and then the blue part pushes in on itself and that becomes the yellow endoderm right here. This is in blue, it's the ectoderm. And then in red, that's the mesoderm. Now, this map, this hole, called the blastopore, becomes, in this case, the mouth. So that's where we get the protostome. The mouth is forming first. In this case, you have the mouth forming second, the anus forming first. And there's the anus, and there's the mouth. And so that is, uh, that's what we call the fate of the blastopore. Again, that's way more information than you need, you need to know. Uh, just understand that there are differences between true coelomates and the protostomes are uh, not as advanced as the deuterostomes. Well, here's another diagram that shows you the going back. Over here I said the formation of the coelom is different. This is how the formation of the coelom is different. Here's the mesoderm. And what's going to happen is the mesoderm is going to split. Now a person with a split personality is called what? Schizophrenic. Or schizophrenic, right? And, and so uh, here we call the splitting of the coelom schizocelous development or the schizocelum, even though we say schizophrenic. So, anyway, that's the splitting. Over here, what you have is, here's the gut, and then the mesoderm forms as an outpouching of the gut. And if it keeps going, then that's how you get the coelom right here between the two red layers. So, that is called enterocelous development. Uh, but, you don't need to know those two terms, but understand that the formation of the coelom is different and that more advanced animals are deuterostomes. Okay, we're going to take a look at, at two protostomes today, and then we'll take a look at two different deuterostome groups. The first group is the phyla mollusca, the first of our four phyla today, and the phyla mollusca are the soft-bodied animals. You can see in the picture here that they all have soft bodies, but huh? a lot of these have hard shells. Yeah, but we're talking about the soft body inside the shell. So all of these have soft bodies, but some of these have shells. So we use the number of shells as the classification point. So mollusks are classified on the basis of the number of shells. You either have one shell, like a snail. You have two shells, like most of the um, shellfish in this picture 
Or you have not three, but zero shells. Like an octopus doesn't seem to have an obvious shell. Um, a squid at the very top has an internal shell. So it doesn't look like it has a shell. So we classify it with the, the zero shell octopi. So um, mollusca are the soft biting animals classified on the basis of the number of shells. A few comments about morphology before we talk about the taxonomy and the reproduction. God bless you. Uh, these guys are bilateral at some point in their life cycle. Sometimes it's not as obvious as it, as it is in other animals. And I've told you before that a shortcut is if it has a head, it's bilateral. Well, does that mean if it doesn't have a head, it's not bilateral? Well, take a look at a clam. It doesn't seem to have an obvious head. But it does have, it, it is bilateral during part of its life cycle. So we say that molesta are bilateral. There's a snail, and the snail does have a head. So, uh, so mollusca are bilateral. Here are three tissue layers that are found inside the mollusk. The first one's called the visceral mass. Now, most of the organs come from the visceral mass, and, uh, and so that's the importance of the visceral mass. It's the origin of the organs, if you will. The second one, the foot, is the, uh, the part of the mollusk that's involved in locomotion, in movement. So if you're picturing a snail, the part of the snail that comes into contact with the ground or if it's a water snail in your aquarium that's attached to the glass, that's walking on its foot. On the other hand, with squid and octopi, they have tentacles, and the tentacles seem to be involved in, in movement. So the tentacles make up the foot of the squid and octopi. So the foot is the part of the body that's involved with locomotion, with movement. And then thirdly, you have the mantle. The mantle has a few different jobs. One job is that the mantle forms a thin membrane, and that thin membrane is eventually becomes the gills of the, of the uh, mollusk. So the mantle is the source of the gills. It's also the source of the, of the hard shell. The shell comes from the mantle. A third uh, important feature of the mantle is because it acts like the gills, it's used for uh, respiration. It's also used as part of the uh, part of the digestive system. And things that are trapped in the gills get moved along to the digestive system of the mollusk. So these are three important uh, parts of the, any mollusk, the visceral mass where most of the organs come from, the foot that's involved in movement, and the mantle, which is used for, for uh, collecting food, for breathing, and is the source of the shell in the mollusk. Now, the visceral mass leads to many different organs, and so we do have what's called the organ, organ system level of organization in mollusca. Yesterday, in the last lecture, we saw that there was a cell level organization in, in the periphera. There's tissue level organization in the cnidarian. Now we see that there is organ system level of classification. Another organ is called the radula. And the term uh, that, the way we used to say the radula was we used to describe it as the rasping radula. And, uh, and that's not as useful as it used to be because I don't know how many of you have used a rasp, but uh, you may have. Uh, if you don't know what a rasp is, it's like a, like a wood file. It's a little chunkier, and it takes off pieces of, of wood. When you, if you don't want to use sandpaper and sand all day, you might use a rasp first. So a radula is, a, is something that's used to scrape, and a snail has a, a radula, and it's used to scrape, and again, an aquarium snail, as it walks along the glass, it will scrape the glass and take all your algae off of that. So that's the radula. So we're going to see the radula in the mollusca. These guys do have a coelom, uh, and uh, it is a true coelom. Again, they have uh, system level 
organization. So two systems that are particularly important in the mollusca are the circulatory system and the excretory system. So they do have systems. So even something as small as a snail, it's pretty well developed. It has a lot of the uh, organs and structures that we're going to see um, in higher organisms. So the circulatory and excretory system. So those are some basic comments about mollusca. Uh, that's some um, basic morph morphological uh, comments that, that, I, that I have on, on mollusca. But now that we've taken a look at mollusca, we can take a look at, now that we've taken a look at morphology, we can take a look at reproduction. That would be the general way that we look at the remaining groups. We'll take a look at some general biology, uh, something about their body types and forms or morphs in morphology. We'll look at reproduction. And then finally look at their uh, taxonomic classification. So we'll take a look at reproduction now. And we'll tell you that most of these organisms are dioecious. Um, on top of that, they have a modal larval stage. And the terms, the types are important for you to, to remember, the trochophore and the villager. But, they, but it's, what's important to know and understand is that the the immature form, the larval stage, does have cilia. You can see the cilia right here around this wheel structure, and you have the cilia over here, the ring of cilia. And these cilia, just like you saw in, in Protista, are used for movement. Just like a paramecium uses cilia to move around. Well, these guys use the cilia to move around, and that's important, and we've seen this before in many different organisms below here, but we're trying to spread out the individuals that makes for a more successful species. If you're a clam and you're having 500 kids, you don't want all 500 kids right next to you because you're trying to eat and then you're trying to eat the same food. So it would be more useful, it wouldn't be um, a more, a, they, it would be more successful, all of these organisms would be more successful if the individuals spread out. So they spread out with this modal larval stage that minimizes competitions, disperses individuals. All right, now with mollusca, there are three major classes. The diagram shows you the four largest classes of mollusca. These are the chitons, and I won't be covering the chitons, but um, the other three are the gastropods, the bivalves, and the cephalopods. So we're going to take a look at those each in turn. Let's take a look at the gastropods first. Here are the gastropods, and the there's the uh, banana slugs again, and there's some snails. The gastropods are also called the univalvia, and actually that term is becoming more and more in use because it makes sense. If you take a look at the term univalvia, una means what? One. One. Valvia has to do with the shell. So univalvia, these are critters that have one shell. Snails have one shell. Slugs are relatives of snails, so we group them with the snails. And so uh, a couple of comments <clears throat> about the gastropods. And the term gastropod uh, actually then means, if we take that one apart, pod means foot. Gastro has to do with uh, what? What's gastro? The, the stomach, right. So gastropod are the stomach-footed critters. So you have these snails, and if you think of it, that's a pretty good name, because it looks like a snail is walking on its stomach. So that's uh, gastropods. Now, if you've ever salted a snail, I know you have. If you've ever salted a snail or seen a snail salted, it, when it to, when, it, uh, when you first expose it to the salt, it, it goes back into itself, if you will, right? And it closes the door to its house. Well, that door is the operculum. Now, before you salt it, in, in an environment where there is um, a minimal amount of moisture, it'll close that in order to um, prevent desiccation. In English, that means to, in order to prevent drying out, it has this harder door, the operculum, that it shuts to minimize that water loss. So that's something to know about the gastropods. Also, gastropods exhibit torsion. 
We've seen torsion before, but in plants. And we didn't call it torsion then, but what happened was in phototropism, when a plant was responding to light, if that's the light over there in that little window, then the plant would be bending toward the light. Why? Because the side away from the light is growing faster. Same thing with torsion. The, side, the bottom side of the snail is growing faster than the top, so it starts to curl up. And it keeps doing that during development, and that's why you get this curly thing going. Because of unequal, uh, unequal growth during development, that's what causes these spirals in a snail. That's called torsion. And here's a term that you know from your, from your pre-lab and from yesterday's discussion. Uh, these organisms are hermaphroditic, which means they're also what? You remember? They're, they have both male and female. There's a term that starts with an M. Do you know it? They're monoecious. Very good. All right. So they're hermaphroditic or monoecious. Uh, these are the gastropods. All right. Here's the next group, the bivalves. Now the bivalves, you can figure that one out. If the univalves have one shell, then what's, what does bivalvia mean? Two. Yeah, two shells. So bivalves, two shells. The other term is a little, it's, um, it's fairly interesting. Uh, the term pelisopoda, uh, pod means foot again. And when, uh, when you're looking at a clam, now snails move very slowly, right? Well, clams move even slower because they live in the sand. So this is the way a clam moves. A clam, over a couple hour period of time, will put out a muscular foot. And at the end of the muscular foot, when it's done extending that muscular foot, a knob comes at the end of the foot and enlarges. So you have this muscular foot with a big knob on it. And then over the next few hours, it'll pull itself along using this as an anchor, right? And so that's how the clam moves through the sand bed. Huh. Well, whoever named them Pelisopoda thought that that knob at the end of the muscular foot looked like a camp axe or a hatchet. You ever use a camp axe to set up your tent? Uh, not, don't use the chopper side, use the other side like a hammer. Okay. And, and so that camp axe or hatchet, little mini axe, that's what pelisa means. So pelisopod means hatchet footed. So it's thought that that little knob looks like a hatchet. Well, some examples of clams, oysters, mussels, and scallops that can't move around much, they're stuck in the sand. So they have to have a specialized means of, uh, of feeding. So they put out two tubes. They put out these, uh, what are called the in-current and the X-current siphon. So here's a siphon, it's a tube, and it puts it out above the sand. Water goes in the in-current, but water goes out the X-current. And in the meantime, while it goes going through the body, while it's going past the mantle through the gills, um, it's plankton, microscopic organisms in the ocean, the plankton get trapped, and that's what they eat. So clams are filter feeders. The third group is the cephalopods. Cephalopod. Now, if we take a look at that term, pod means foot. You know what cephala means? Someone does. No? Head. Head. Good. Head and foot. Yeah. Okay. So, cephalopod, or maybe those of you who have kids, maybe they had, uh, uh, what is that called? <laughs> what? There's all kinds of different cephala, cephala. My son, Mikey, uh, I told you about already, didn't I? Uh, Mikey has a larger than normal head, or he did when he was small. And so when I coached his t-ball team, I had to give him my hat because the little kid hats wouldn't fit his head. Um, it used to be shaped a little uniquely, too. They used to say his head looked like Hey Arnold's head. You know, like a little football head. <laughs> That? Anyway, he's grown into it, but he had a condition called macrocephaly, which is big head, so big head. 
Um, so cephaly means head. Cephalo, head, pod, foot. These then are called the head-footed mollusks. And if you look at an octopus or a squid, ooh, I could actually draw a squid. Yeah, and you know, I don't draw it all that well, so I'm not gonna do it right now or anything. But if, if you, I was going to draw it, I'd draw a head, and I'd draw some tentacles. Ta-da, I'm done. That's a head-footed mollusk. Octopus and squid, you can see the octopus down here. Here's a giant squid, that's a pretty big squid. They say there's some squid that we haven't seen that are floating around at the bottom of the ocean that fight with whales. Um, the first evidence for it was that in the transatlantic phone cables, there's these big bites in there that they think came from giant squid, but you never really catch one. Be kind of cool to do though, because we can get uh, a large, if you have a, a squid that's about this big, you can pull one large nerve from it. So that's actually important because then we can do some nerve research. So imagine the nerve that we can get from this guy. Does it have to be living? Say again? Does it have to be living? No, you, it, it, you can, since nerves are, you know, we, we send electrical messages down nerves if you just have one. You can, what do, you gotta cut it up and figure out how it works, but you could probably generate a, a message down there. Yeah, so let's do some research. <clears throat> now with the uh, squid, they have what are called camera eyes. With the camera eye, the thing about camera eyes is that you move the lens back and forth. So like if you've ever had a, a manual camera, or even if you have a point and shoot, you can see the lens go back and forth. For us, instead of having a static uh, and hard lens, we, our lens, you can actually mold a little bit. So we have muscles on, uh, on the sides of our lens and we, we pull that and the lens uh, changes shape ever so slightly and that's how we focus. But squid and octopi, instead, they have a hard lens that moves back and forth. So they have camera eyes and they're very good at what they do. Um, they're, they're thought to be some of the most successful invertebrates. They're very good hunters because they have very good vision and they're quite fast. They move through jet propulsion. What they do is take in water and they have this, uh, this tube called the siphon, just like we saw earlier in the clam, and they point the siphon in the opposite direction of the way they want to go. They can turn it like a nozzle. And, and you point in the opposite direction and then you squirt out the water and it goes out. Well, by taking water in the, uh, in the organism and squirting it out the siphon and doing that over and over, these guys can even move it about 12 miles an hour. Which is maybe not that impressive if you 12 miles an hour, how fast do you walk? You walk like four miles an hour, or if you're, if you're at a good clip, you know, you might walk at three miles an hour. Or can you run 12 miles an hour? Not very long. Not like no, not for very long. And for me, not an hour. If I, if I ran for an hour, would I, would I run 12 miles? No, I don't think so. But a squid would go all day long, go 12 miles an hour. So that's pretty amazing. Uh, some of these guys are very good uh, at migration because they can move back and forth and go up and down, not just across, and you're thinking they're, they're gonna swim from you know, Hawaii to Australia, but they swim up and down the water column and go down and come back up on a daily basis. Uh, the last term here, melanophores, this explains why or how octopi change their colors pretty quickly. They have uh, some pigments, just like we have pigments in our skin, uh, we have melanin, but they have melanophores and they have some, some skin pigments that move along these predetermined channels when they get scared or when they're trying to blend in with the environment. So it can change colors pretty quickly within a matter of second because of these melanophores. So these melanophores help with that um, coloration change, <clears throat> whether that's a uh, change in um, coloration for protection, we call that protective coloration or camouflage, and, or if you're trying to, you know, the universal signal for danger is red, so then they'll, they'll turn red and, and you get scared because the octopus just turned red on you. So that's because of the melanophores. Oh, here's a funny. One squid, ten votes. Support equal rights for cephalopods. I don't know.
don't know where that came from. Okay. So, um, next group, the annelids. Four groups today, second group, annelids. Now, the annelids actually are the third group of worms, and should I have talked about these when I talked about the worms? Maybe, but there is some discussion as to which one, it, or whether we should put them before or after mollusca because of, uh, because of their, uh, their larval forms. Jonathan. Okay, thank you for pointing that out. All right, mental note, check the pre-lab. All right, um, annelids. The annelid, we're going to take a look at morphology again and reproduction and then how they're grouped taxonomically. So let's take a look at morphology. This is what you're going to see, oh, not today, but tomorrow. You're going to see this. Um, you're going to take a look at the earthworm and uh, do your first dissection. I'm going to start about halfway down the worm and then cut along its back surface, ooh, dorsal surface, and go all the way up to the anterior tip of the earthworm. And as you do that, you'll be able to see all these structures here. One is the brain. Do these have a brain? Yes, they do. Not a very huge brain. And, and if you ask me where it is, I'll point to some general area, and it's right around here, and I don't see it. Because what it is, is a brain is an amalgamation of nerve cells. It's a grouping of nerve cells. It's a, it's a, a concentration of nerve cells. And you, you can't really separate it out. Um, so they do have a brain, though. They do have a concentration of nerve cells. They also have a skeleton, but it's not a skeleton like yours. It's not a bony skeleton. It's what we call a hydrostatic skeleton, which means that the muscles that they have have to work against something. Your muscles work against your bones. But these guys have a hydrostatic skeleton. If you take a look at the term hydrostatic, water, water stays in one place. It stays the same. So the hydrostatic skeleton is the, it's a fluid pushing against the, 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 uh, the inside of the skin of the worm. And so the muscles push up against that. So that's a hydrostatic skeleton. Cetae, the third term, uh, are little hair-like structures that are on the ventral surface. And these are used for traction, much like you use tennis shoes for traction when you're running. You run faster when you're wearing your tennis shoes. Ooh, better, cleats. Yeah, they're like little cleats. They're two little cleats on each section. Just thought of that. Like cleats. Okay, uh, next one is they have a, is a closed circulatory system. Now, this is interesting because this is the same type of circulatory system we have. Hmm. By a closed circulatory system, we mean that the blood is always in a blood vessel, whether it's the, the uh, veins going toward the heart, the arteries going away, to the arterioles, to the capillary bed. Our blood is always in blood vessels. Same goes for these guys, though. But some animals, some that we even consider more complex than these worms, have not a closed circulatory system, but an open circulatory system. That means the blood still goes through blood vessels, but every once in a while, the blood goes out of the blood vessels and goes directly into the tissues. Then we, you don't have control over it because it's just going around in the tissues, and then you pick up some of it on the other end. Works for a lot of animals, but not as efficient because you don't have control over your blood all the time. You'll notice you won't find any lungs here. You won't find a respiratory system. You won't find an excretory system that's really established real well to getting rid of nitrogenous waste. Why not? Because you're going to have diffusion of gases through the skin. Earthworms need to stay moist. If they're not moist, then they're going to die because they can't breathe. Uh, the the uh, oxygen in the air has to dissolve into that thin layer of skin, or thin layer of water that's on top of the skin. So diffusion is, is uh, important. And when we're talking about diffusion of oxygen into the thin layer of moisture that's around the worm, or even the other way around, carbon dioxide. The carbon dioxide makes its way out 
of the worm by going through the skin. So those are some comments about the morphology of Anelida. Anelida, again, are the segmented worms. Here is a diagram that shows you a little bit about reproduction in the earthworm. Earthworms are monoecious, but they cross-fertilize. Uh, they have the equipment to self-fertilize, but in order to increase genetic variability, they go head to head and they keep going and they form a mucus bag around this section right here. And you can see here's the male pores where the sperm comes out and it goes from one to the other. Um, some would describe this as a sperm swap. They're just trading sperm and that makes sense because you're increasing genetic variability. Um, then the worms keep going and what it, what's left is this mucus bag. And this mucus bag now has fertilized eggs in it. In fact, if you know what you're looking for in your compost pile or even in the dirt, you can find some of these earthworm casings, they're called where the uh, earthworms are going to be found. So monoecious, cross-fertilized. The, the, the uh, lightly colored band is important in reproduction. It's called the clitellum. You're going to see that when you take a look at the worm tomorrow. And the mucus bag we already talked about. So that, those are some comments about reproduction. As far as the taxonomy goes, here are the three significant classes of annelids. We have the polychaetes, the earthworms, and the leeches. The polychaetes are the marine worms. Earthworms are what you usually think of when you think of the annelids. And the third group are the ectoparasitic leeches. So here's a polychaete. Polychaetes are the marine worms. And it looks like it has all these hundreds maybe of legs. Hundreds of legs? No, these aren't legs. These are called parapodia. And these parapods increase surface area to aid respiration. So they're not legs at all. It increases the surface area, much like the English muffins we talked about yesterday. increases the space for, for, uh, for your peanut butter and jelly. Uh, just like what we saw in the planaria, instead of having just a simple diverticulated cecum, it has all these little nooks and crannies inside the, uh, the digestive system, inside the cecum. So each of these little parapods it gives a, a new surface area where things can dissolve back and forth, where diffusion could occur. So that's how it aids respiration. Now we'll spend some time on earthworms tomorrow, but here are just a couple of comments on earthworms. The first is that, well, one re there are two really good reasons to have your earthworm be your, your first significant dissection. One is that they're hard to mess up, and you get the feel of how deep to cut when, when you cut with an earthworm. So that's why we start with the earthworm. Another one is that they're not actually all that bad because you have a complete digestive system. That means you have a mouth and you have an anus and you have organs that go from the mouth to the anus. Two in particular that you're going to see tomorrow are the crop and the gizzard. The crop is, in, is right here. The gizzard is right behind it. Now these guys have a crop just like birds do. The crop is where food is stored and it's stored until the gizzard can get to it. Now if you've ever eaten gizzard, anyone ever eaten gizzard? If you've ever eaten gizzards, it's kind of, kind of gritty, sandy. That's because what birds do, if you watch a bird, you know, birds will pick up worms and things like that. But if you watch a pigeon, it'll go and peck it peck of rocks and things. If you have a pet bird, you've got to put some shells in there and your bird will look around through the shells and find a, a perfect shell and grab that and swallow it. Why do birds swallow rocks? And the answer is because they don't have teeth. They swallow the rocks and the rocks go to their gizzards and their gizzard grinds up the food that's in the crop. So first the food goes to the crop and then it goes to the gizzard and it's ground up in the gizzard and then it goes through this long intestine. Now it's long so that you can absorb more and more of the nutrients. 
So a complete digestive system. Yeah, Mike. Is an earthworm a polychaete, or is this? No, an earthworm is actually in its in its own group. It's called an oligochaete, but you don't need to know that. It's, a, it's one of the three classes. So the polychaetes are the marine worms. The earthworms are in a separate group, and the leeches are in a third group. So is this? this are we in the second group? I missed this. This slide. is the second group, but this is no, no. This is the here's the polychaetes, and here's the earthworms. So you didn't miss a slide. Here. This is a. Uh, it's the classes, and so there are three different classes. And then there's the first class, and then here's the second class. Now the second comment on this slide has to do with hearts. And, and you may hear that earthworms have 10 hearts. Hmm, do they really? Well, if you consider a heart to be a more muscular part of a blood vessel that pumps blood, that sounds like a heart. Well, okay, they have 10 hearts then. What they do is they have these 10 arches, and you'll see they're dark brown, almost black, and they have five of them, and, and both of the ends are considered by some to be hearts. So that's why they say that earthworms have 10 hearts. They have five arches with, with uh, two hearts on each heart, with two hearts on each arch. And so that's why we say that earthworms have 10, 10 uh, hearts or five aortic arches. Here's a picture of some leeches. Um, anyone ever had any experience with leeches? All right, very good. Uh, I had a colleague who used to bring leeches into the classroom during leech day and would give extra credit to someone if they put a leech on their face and let it sit for the period or the class. <laughs> uh, I think that this was at the end. Are there any volunteers? I think this was, ah, I, this was at the end of his career. Uh, he uh, actually lost it after 20 plus years in education. He did stuff like that. Because, you know, 20 plus years in education, enough to drive anyone crazy. But, uh, yeah, so, so he did that. Uh, before he quit, he also, and this was, you got to understand, this is my friend David, who was a, who was a, a shorter, balder, Jewish or Jewish, more Jewish uh, guy. And, and he, he lost a daughter to leukemia, and then he, he and his wife had gone through all that, and then she divorced him, so he was just, ah. Uh, and uh, and uh, the, la one, the last year I knew him, he said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quit teaching. I'm going to sell everything. I'm going to move to the Philippines and I'm going to get a young 12, 13 year old bride. <laughs> wow. And he almost did that. His bride was 14 years old. So. Crazy, right? Um, anyway, why are we talking about this? Leeches. So, leeches <laughs> are ectoparasites. You put them on their cheek, but they, what they do is they, they suck your blood. And as they're sucking your blood, they have a uh, anticoagulant to keep that open. Um, yeah, so leeches. Leeches are, are the, a representative of the third group. We, you may see some of these in a laboratory even today, I think. No, no, not today. Tomorrow you're going to see the antlets. Tomorrow you're going to see the nematodes today. All right, here's the third out of four groups. This is phylum Arthropoda. This is the organizing slide for it. We're going to take a look at some general characteristics of arthropods. We'll take a look at morphology, and then we'll take a look at the uh, taxonomic classification of the arthropods. There are over a million different arthropods, and most of these are insects, and most of those insects are beetles and cockroaches and their relatives. I probably have a slide on this. Let me see. Oh, not well? Yeah. Hmm, I thought I did. Okay. Anyway, so uh, those aren't significant factoids, you know. That's just to give you an idea of the uh, enormous uh, diversity in the Arthropoda. All right. Then we have these five groups. The, we have the spiders, the crustaceans, and the crabs, and, and lobsters, and crawdads. And then we have the centipedes, millipedes, and then finally the big group is the insects. So let's, let's go for a ride. General characteristics. Uh, arthropods are called arthropods because they have jointed legs, right? Jointed legs. Uh, pod is foot, joint for arthro. Uh, when I used to call my mom on the phone, I'd say, hey mom, how's it going? She would say, oh, my arthritis is killing me. 
right? It's a pain in the joints, so jointed legs. Uh, segmented. All of these guys show segmentation. It's more obvious here than it is in us. Like if you take a look at the centipede, obvious segmentation. Those of you who are doing the zoo assignment last minute, and it's due tomorrow, remember the segmentation is all the animals at the zoo show some type of segmentation. All right, jointed leg segmentation, exoskeleton. These guys all have an exoskeleton also. Exoskeleton is a hard outer shell. No, should I take that back? Not a shell, it's like hard skin. Not quite a shell, but it's pretty hard. Which explains why when I was a sophomore at UCLA, I lived uh, a block away from Frat Row in some really old, run-down apartments that were built in the 1910s. Pretty rustic, but uh, pretty nasty too. And I'd come home late at night and we would creep up to the door and be very quiet and then flick on the light real quick and then you could watch the cucarachas running around. I know because it's college, that's what you do. Uh, but I remember vividly, I saw one cockroach that was about this big, no, this big. And another one a little bit smaller, but they were obviously doing something. But they were end to end, so, one, so their heads were pointing in opposite directions. And when I turned on the light, you ever seen that? fun when you see that. And then they both <laughs> try to run, but they're going in opposite directions. So, Whoa. anyway, um, when you step on a cockroach that, that you hear is the exoskeleton. Speaking of the exoskeleton, the exoskeleton is made out of a chemical called chitin that we've seen before. It's a chitinous exoskeleton, the fungus. We saw chitin in the fungus. And so that's a a matrix that's made up of carbohydrates and proteins, uh, chitinous exoskeleton, it's a good chemical for this. But uh, the exoskeleton doesn't grow. It's like if you have a young child and you buy him clothes, you know you're going to have to go back to Walmart in a couple months anyway. Because the clothes don't grow with them, do they? <laughs> and so you molt out of them. And so here's the crawdad. The crawdad is a... Uh, is green because of the different uh, uh, chemical that carries the blood in, in, uh, in crawdads. But uh, this is red, and this is what it usually looks like, but it's, it's shedding that off. It'll eat most of that to hide the evidence of the molting, and then it'll go crawl into a, a hole for three or four days while this stuff hardens up a little bit. Because this is a very, uh, uh, a very unsafe time for for crawdads in this part of their life cycle. Another thing about external morphology is that these guys have compound eyes. That means it's a little teeny eye, uh, hundreds of, of, of little eyes, I guess you could say. The little eyes are called omatidia, right? The, the little eyes don't work as well as our eyes, but they sense motion pretty well. So you can see a change in, in shades of an amount of light and so if a fly is, if you're, if you're trying to sneak up on a fly, it's hard to do, isn't it? But if you, if, if you move very gradually, it'll see you. But if you move kind of jerky and get behind it, get your fly swatter up, and snack them all of a sudden, it's because of the omatidia, right? Practical applications of your knowledge, children. Internal morphology. All right, these guys have an open circulatory system, which is not as good as we've seen earlier. Open circulatory system, the blood bathes the tissues, but it works for these guys. So why change it? So the open circulatory system, they have a, a respiratory system. Instead of having lungs, they have a spiracle, which is a hole. They have many holes in their body, and each of these holes are spiracles leads to a network of tubes. But it turns out that every cell is close enough to a trachea, it's close enough to, to be able to exchange gases uh, in, a, in, a, in a way that it's successful. So respiratory system doesn't have to be where you have a bunch of lungs or, or gills. It can be in some of these different arthropods, 
but in many of them, the spiritual, just the hole in the body is good enough. When we take a look at the grasshopper, some of you will only look at the external anatomy, but some of you will be adventurous and want to open it up. The main thing you're going to see is the malpigian tubules. You'll see a bunch of these little stringy structures that are going back and forth. That's the excretory system of the grasshopper. The grasshopper you're going to see in the lab is about this big and black. Cool. So, yeah. Black. I'll bet you you see some malpigian tubules tomorrow. Uh, nervous system. These guys do have a nervous system. They have a brain, but that brain can be, if you chop off its head, it can still do a lot because it has these ganglia that are scattered about the body. Some are dorsal, that's the D. Some are ventral, that's the V. So we have a dorsal ventral ganglia system. We have, we have groups of nerves scattered throughout the body. And so if you cut off your head, the, the, the brain is inhibited and the rest of the ganglia sort of take over. So the body can do a lot even when there's no head, when that brain is inhibited by that brain inhibitor that's released when you chop off the head. So that's a little about the internal morphology. The pictures, the spiracle, it's pointing to the spiracle right there. And it leads to a network of, of tubes. That's not a very clear picture on that. Um, here's an ant. Here's the head, the thorax, and the abdomen. The thorax we're going to see later is uh, in the insect like this one. All the legs are attached to the thorax. But this picture, I, my intent was to show you the malpigian tubules, which are part of the excretory system. So now that we've seen that, let's take a look at the five different types by major types of groups in the arthropods. And so here's the arachnids, which is the first group, class arachnida. You probably are familiar with arachnophobia, or maybe you have it. I know I do to some extent. And there's a black widow in my backyard. My kids yell and run around. Ah, black widow. I have to take my shoe off and kill it, even though it's outside. How sad. Alright, so there's a black widow and the brown recluse is a, uh, another well-known spider that is uh, not very nice to, with as far as, uh, you know, bites to humans. Um, we have uh, uh, spiders that, that uh, build webs, so there's a, yeah, all kinds of different spiders. But you have spiders and the scorpions are in this group. Uh, here are two terms, the chelicerae and the pedipalps. Those are, the, are some of the first few appendages. If you look at the scorpion diagram right here, you'll see here's the chelicerae. Uh, it's a chelicera right there. And those are, those are parts, of the, parts of the mouth, but some are kind of, the chelicerae are chewing parts of the mouth. And the pedipalps, what the pedipalps do is they hold the food. So you have these structures that hold the food, and then you have these mouth parts that chew on the food a little bit. So it's almost like having these little arms or little appendages that have different jobs as far as uh, when eating is concerned. Speaking of appendages, then you have four pairs of walking legs after that. That means you have eight legs all together on your handout today. That would be one of the questions, like how many legs does a spider have? And the answer is eight. And it's not a trick question. Four Four pairs of legs, that's eight. Um, spiders have external digestion. And that makes sense when you think about what you already know about a spider. If you have an orb weaver that has a big web and a fly gets caught in the web, then, then it struggles and it tires out and it stops. And then the spider comes over and wraps it up. But also, what you may not realize is that the spider also injects it with uh, protease, which is um, a chemical that's going to break down the, the fly, it's going to put some enzymes in there. And over, over time, then that fly will break down. Then the spider comes back after a few hours or so and sucks that right up. So that's external digestion. Um, arachnids have book lungs, which are, if you look at the term, a book lung, it's like a book has many pages. The book lung has many thin tissues, and that's why it's called a book lung. It's the best picture I could find of it, but I don't see it really well there. So 
So that's a book one. So those are the arachnids at the first of the five groups of the arthropods. Here's the second group. Here's the crustacean. You're going to look at these in the laboratory uh, soon. Um, I want to say on Wednesday, we'll be taking a look at the crustacea. And you'll be doing a crawdad dissection, which is the diagram that's the, the black diagram in the bottom left corner. You can see that what crustacea have is they have a fused middle and head region. So because head means, or cephalo means head, uh, we, the term is cephalothorax. So now we have one thing with the head and, head and thorax joined together called the cephalothorax. And then you have the abdomen as well. These guys have two pair of antennae, which is in comparison to the one pair of antennae we're going to see in insects. And they have three pair of chewing appendages. We saw that, uh, you, you saw the chelicery in the uh, arachnids, and it compares to that. So these are crabs and lobsters and crawdads. These are all examples of crustacea. All right. Uh, here's, a, here's a funny, but it's, it's British humor, so it's not that funny. <laughs> if you're happy and you know it, clap your claws. Uh, okay. Um, <laughs> Subphylum, Uramia, the last three. Um, I got this from a foreign website as well. And so you can see that, what? That's a, uh, and, and the terms, you don't even need to know that. But know this, that you have three other classes. You have the insects and the centipedes and the millipedes. But these, are, these three are grouped in what's called a subphylum. Now, we haven't seen a subphylum yet, but sometimes the seven-level classification system doesn't quite work out for us. So sometimes we have subphyla and we have supra supra families and supra orders and subspecies. So uh, if you have more than seven divisions, we come up with these other uh, names like the subphylum Uniramia. Well, the subphylum Uniramia is divided up into three classes. You have the insects, oops, check that, the centipedes, and then you have the millipedes, and finally the insects. Well, let's take a look at the centipedes first. Centipedes, here's a photo of a centipede. And it has one pair of legs per segment. That's in comparison to millipedes. Millipedes have two pairs of legs per segment. It doesn't have exactly 100 legs, but if you can see, it, that's ballpark, right? If you have 50 segments and you have two legs per segment, well, 50 times two is 100. So the name centipede, 100 legs, makes sense. One pair of legs per segment. Um, if you think you've seen a centipede before, maybe you haven't. Maybe you've seen a millipede. Centipedes are, are distinctly flat. And so they, they look much flatter than a millipede. Um, centipedes are also carnivores. They'll eat insects. They'll eat uh, things that are... They'll eat worms. They'll attack things. So centipede, not necessarily very nice. So they're carnivorous. Uh, they could bite you, centipedes can, and that's what a centipede is. Now compare this to the millipede. Now this is a huge millipede. I've never seen one naturally like this. I've seen one at the zoo in collections, insect collections or invert collections, but never this big. But you may have seen working around your house, you may have seen some millipedes that might be an inch long. You know, so millipedes have a thousand legs. Well, do they? Well, 500 to 700 segments. Okay, so that's a lot of segments. So, not really, not really a thousand. I think actually that number is not segments. That number has to do with, with the number of legs. So they don't have a thousand legs, but they might have five to 700 legs. So, but they do have two pairs of legs per segment. Also, these are not flat like the centipedes are. These curl up. And they're, they're curved, as you can see in the photo. Also, millipedes are, are not carnivores, but they're, they're detritivores for the most part. So they're going to clean up your forest floor, and they're going to go through the dirt and eat dead plant parts and be decomposers that way in the environment. So they are they're good to the environment because they're recycling these plant parts, these chemicals. Yeah, Jonathan. I'm sure that they, they could. Um, I don't, I've never 
never seen one do it, but but I would guess that they are. Yeah, that they do do that. They, they'll, they'll, it seems like they eat a lot of plant matter, whether it's living or dead, and fungi typically very plant-like. Okay. All right, here's the organized slide, slide for the last group in the arthropods. These are the insects. You can see the insects have one pair of antennae, three body parts, and three pairs of legs attached to the thorax. We're going to see that. The uh, major classification point is the mouth parts, but a secondary classification point is how many wings they have. And then some insects are a little more advanced than other insects. There are three that we call the Hymenoptera, which are the social insects. Those include the ants and the bees and the termites. I mean, think about termites able to build huge mounds in Africa that contribute to global warming. Right? Because the methane that they produce in their mounds is released to the environment. But they, uh, those particular groups of insects, we're going to take a look at some of their sense receptors and how they actually communicate. All right. So let's take a look at number one. Number one is that they actually, before we do that, uh, over one million different types of insects and more than half are beetles, cockroaches, and their relatives. You've seen this picture before from our uh, population biology lecture. But uh, we were classifying new insects all the time. When I first started teaching, it was 850,000 different types of insects. Now it's over a million. Over a million different types of insects, but about half of these are beetles, cockroaches, relatives, about 450,000 or so. It's also because beetles preserve well. You can see them in the fossil record, um, even when they're dead. So uh, a lot of animals we don't have evidence for because, because they're made of primarily soft tissues. But the beetles tend to uh, fossilize well. So we know of many different species that are extinct that we see in the fossil record. Okay. Now this we saw before in our organizing slide. There's one pair of antennae. Unlike the two that you saw in the crustacea, we have three body parts, unlike the two that you saw in crustacea. We have three pairs of legs uh, attached to the thorax compared to the four pairs of legs that you saw in the arachnids. So these are some of the distinctions that make insects insects. And on um, the last page, you're going to hand out um, in tomorrow's lab, we'll ask you the number of legs that an insect has. And if a spider has eight legs and an insect has six legs, six legs and three pairs. All right. Now, I would encourage you not to copy down the bulleted items because I would never ask you what type of mouth part does a fly have, although you might be able to guess that's a sponging type of mouth part anyway. If you ever watch a, a fly land and do its thing, and the mouth is got that little red sucker thing on it. Yeah. Uh, but there are other interesting mouth parts as well, like a beetle has a crushing mandible that goes side to side like that. Uh, and butterflies have a elongated tongue-like structure. Well, this variety in mouth parts is used to classify the different insects in their different orders. Another thing that's used to classify insects is the um, type of wing that they have, or even the number of wings that they have. Flies, for example, have two, uh, one pair of wings, but things like a ladybird beetle, like a, a ladybug, um, you can, if you can picture it, it opens up the back wings and then the little wings come out. So you have two pairs of wings in a beetle compared to only one pair in what we call the true flies. So the, the wings are another classification point on top of the type of mouth part. So, insect wings, another classification point. Um, when we were studying our botany, we saw that flowers um, that are used, that, that have bees as pollinators, have a sweet scent. And so, this is obvious, bees do have a sense of smell. Here's something that's maybe not as obvious, that they use magnetism to navigate. We know this from early studies of etiology, where they would take 
small magnets and put them on the backs of bees to see if they could still get home. Well, they can get fairly close, but they can't get exactly to the right place. The same is true for birds. They've done this for migratory birds, and migratory birds will use visual cues like the where the sun is, and ooh, I passed that mountain, I remember that, and, and they'll, they'll, they can get pretty close to home, but they do use magnetism to a degree, and they don't get exactly all the way home because um, there's something about magnetism uh, that, that they sense. Maybe it's the, the uh, magnetic field around the earth and such. So that's, that's interesting. And then the, especially with the insects that are the, uh, are the more advanced social insects, they communicate with each other. So one way they communicate is with sound. Sound and waggle actually kind of go together. But uh, pheromones, um, well, we would, as a, you know, as people, we don't communicate by with pheromones, but what the insects do. That's how they attract mates. And so, uh, if insects do it, then do people do it? Well, no, it doesn't quite work out that way. But, um, but like uh, in the in the 80s, when we had the, the Mediterranean fruit fly crisis, when we had to get rid of the fruit flies. What they did was they had traps that were set up with pheromones to attract all the female flies, and the, or actually the other way around, attract the male flies. You had uh, traps that had the pheromone in it, and the, the flies would uh, would be attracted to that. Also, they 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 uh, radiated uh, millions of flies and, and made them sterile, so that uh, you know a female fly will only mate with just a few male flies. So. If the female fly mates with all all the males that it mated with are all sterile, then it's not going to um, make any fly babies. So um, anyway, pheromones are, are chemical scents they're used to attract, and specifically during uh, mating. But here, all these bees, these bees will make a lot of noise when they find some food. And so here's a dancing scout bee. And if the food is very close, it does what's called a circle dance. and it, goes around a circle, makes a lot of noise, the other bees are attracted, and they go out and they find a food source. When it's a little further away, the bee will, will do a dance here called the waggle dance, and waggle its abdomen back and forth. The more, uh, the longer this waggle is, the further away the food is. But another thing you get from this is that the degree, the angle that's made from the vertical versus the angle of the dance, it's the same as this angle here with the sun and the, uh, uh, the food, uh, the, the hive right there. And then that angle is the same as that angle. So that's how the bee then translates the information over to the rest of the hive, which is interesting because the brains are only this big. So how does it do that? All right, here's the last group for the night. The last group for tonight are the echinodermata. And if you, when you were a teenager, you had to go to a dermatologist, you know, derm means skin, and echino means spiny. So I hope you didn't have spiny skin, but these guys do. Echinodermata, 6,000 species, all of these are marine, and that means they live in the ocean then. Here are the examples, sea urchins, sea stars, sea cucumbers, uh, starfish is a term we tend to not use as biologists because they're not really fish, so we call them sea stars. So here's a sea star here. Here's some uh, California purple sea urchins uh, called Strongliocentris purpuratus, often used in cancer research. Here's a sand dollar, which is also any kind of term. And this is a sea cucumber. All right, so spiny skinned echinodermata. Why are we talking about these so late? It seems like, logically speaking, we should have studied these when we were taking a look at coral and, uh, and sea anemones. It's a sea anemone and sea urchin, kind of similar. Well, actually, echinodermata are pretty advanced, and they're advanced because they have bilateral symmetry. They now they appear to have radial symmetry, like the sea star here. But sometime during development, you have bilateral symmetry. So 
So it says there actually most adults have rattle, uh, radial symmetry, but the larvae are bilaterally symmetrical. So they, uh, they do show bilateral symmetry, but they have other characteristics that are shared only with our group, only with the chordata. Now, going back to the very beginning of the lecture, we were talking about coelom and how the coelom is divided up into a coelom and the pseudo coelom and the true coelom and then that the true coelom is divided up into protostomes and the deuterostomes well this is the only invertebrate group that has the deuterostomes in it so these guys are advanced uh, beyond the other invertebrates and the only other uh, group that has uh, the deuterostomes is the chordata which is what we belong to Remember, that means the mouth forms second. The mouth forms second during the development of the blastopore. The blastopore being that, that hole where the, the blastula, when the blastula folds into itself. So that right there, and this um, diagram becomes not the mouth, but it becomes the anus. Yeah? For test purposes, if we're asked about a C star and if it was at bilateral symmetry or radial symmetry? Well, you would say. I guess my point in mentioning it is to show you why. I mean, it, you would think that, and the answer is radial. Okay. But you would think that it, you would clap, you would study them with the other radial organisms. But the reason why you don't is because during their life cycle they're partially bilateral as well. Okay. So these guys do have uh, radial symmetry, but bilateral symmetry in part of their life cycle. They're also deuterostomes, just like we are. They also have an endoskeleton, just like we do. Now, our endoskeleton is made out of bones, and these guys have ossicles instead, which are very similar to bones. We call them bone-like, and they're bone-like in the sense that they have uh, minerals that, that uh, harden up. So you've got bone-like plates, these are called ossicles, and so there are endos these have endoskeletons. Remember the insects, they have an exoskeleton, not an endoskeleton like these guys have. So an endoskeleton with ossicles. As far as their nervous system goes, they have a nerve ring. They don't have they don't have a head, really, do they? No, they don't seem to have a head, but they have a nerve ring. And so they have a nerve ring that goes in that central portion and radiates out to all of the legs. <clears throat> Typically, the Echidermata uh, the are going to have parts in multiples of five, but some of them don't quite follow that rule. But this one does here. You've got the five legs. Um, You're also going to see that in... Uh, in sand dollars, they have those five, well, let's go back to the sand dollar picture. You know, here you have those five petals of the flower, if you will. So typically, um, in parts of five. Groups of five. Oh, the nerve ring then allows coordinated movement. And, uh, and so, although these guys don't have a brain, per se, they still can move around in a coordinated way. So still quite advanced, even though they, they don't have a brain that's similar to ours. Um, what, another thing that's important is the water vascular system. Now with the water vascular system, they have water in these tubes that lead to what we call tube feet and finally end in what are called the ampullae. Now an ampulla is, uh, is like the suction cup of a starfish. You know, and maybe you've seen the bottom of a sea star, and it's got those little suckers. Those suckers that you know, are called the ampulla. And uh, because it has those suckers on its arms, and because it has this water vascular system, it's able to extend uh, a force over a long period of time. It's like, uh, it's like a hydraulic system in your car. Because the hydraulic system, when you, when you press on the brakes, you've got brake fluid, and that brake fluid, uh, allow, if you're, you're pressing on that fluid and that pressure that you're pressing on the fluid and the brake and your brake pedal is the same pressure that's going to be applied to the larger brake pad. And that's what stops your car. Same thing here. You're going to have, you have water inside this um, system. It's kind of like a circulatory system. But uh, the same, uh, the, the force is going to be spread out in each of these suckers. So it's going to pull. Uh, things apart. Uh, we'll see how it eats in just a moment. Another thing that happens in sea stars is they have a good, well-known ability to regenerate. 
you chop off an arm, grows a new one. Plus, if you got some of the middle central disc, that lost arm will grow into a new individual. And you can actually see some of those floating around. They're called comets because it looks like a starfish leg with four little points on it. So you can see why it's called a comet. So let's see, ability to regenerate. And then some of these guys uh, do eject their viscera. What that means is if you've got a sea cucumber like this and it feels threatened, what it may do is spit out this gooey substance on you and it's kind of sticky and spiky too. And so it might freak you out and it would freak animals out, predators out, and that's the point. It's throwing its internal organs at you because it can make some new ones anyway. So here, take my organs, leave me alone. Just like I like the lizard with the tail. You scare a lizard and the tail drops off. Well here you scare a sea cucumber and its internal organs drop off. And they stick to you and it's icky. So it's sea cucumber. They'll eject the viscera. Our final picture for tonight is a picture of a sea star that's eating a clam. You see the clam? No, it's totally surrounding the clam. And it's using those suckers that pull the clam open. Now you'll see, not tonight, but tomorrow, the clams are really hard to open. And the way we're going to do it in the laboratory is we're going to cut the muscles and jam it a razor blade in there and cut the muscles. Well, how does a sea star eat a clam then? It's said that if a sea star can make an opening in a clam that's two or three millimeters wide, then it'll take, the sea star will take its stomach, and its stomach will turn inside out and go outside the body and go into that crack and go into the clam, and it'll just sit there for hours because it's digesting the clam's body. And then when it's done, the stomach just goes back into the sea star. And that's how it eats. Can you imagine? Like if there's a burger right there, and your stomach comes out, and blah, touches the hamburger for hours. When you're done, you just go back. So it just diffuses its, it diffuses it into its stomach, doesn't really chew it. Yeah, but it's, it's like into the inside out stomach. Yeah, so, 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 yeah, that's a way to look at it. It's diffusing it to the, the, uh, the layer of the stomach. Yes, it is, but it's rather interesting, I think. And so that's my last comments for tonight. Do you have any questions on the anything we talked about today? Yeah, yeah. second down first. Thing. I'm sorry, go ahead. Um, my question was just about our grades, so that might be You have a good, you will, I'll pull up the, uh, I can pull up the, the grading sheet in, in the lab and talk about you specifically. But All right, tonight we're going to talk about the higher invertebrates.